Greetings ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Politrix, where we look at the national and current events in the political arena in Zimbabwe. My name is Albert Mavunga and today on the show we have Munashe, a political commentator from the city of Kings. Munashe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Albert. Now let's jump right into it. The events that happened last week in Zimbabwe, what's your opinion on the political protests uh, economic protests that took place on Monday the 14th to Wednesday the 16th of January? Uh, well, my opinion is primarily a personal opinion. Uh, what happened um, on Monday up to Wednesday is really unfortunate uh, because what was supposed to be a peaceful demonstration as purported by the organizers turned into something that was unseen where a lot of looting, a demonstration that was coupled with violence, looting of shops, burning of cars, and beating of citizens in general uh, took the order of the day. So it was um, an unfortunate um, era in the new dispensation because we never thought that uh, with the spirit of the new dispensation we could be having those kind of scenes as what we witnessed last week. Now, were people willing to participate in this protest, in this so-called stay away? First and foremost, you need to understand that Zimbabweans are not pushovers. Zimbabweans are not people who just do things because they are doing them. Zimbabweans do things because they want to. But in, this, in the context of this uh, demonstration, you realize that uh, people were being coerced to, do, to, to stay away from work. Remember that city you called for a nationwide stay away. The idea was to stay away from work, stay away from school, and stay away from business. And so we had people that said, okay, it's their democratic right to do, to stay away. But there were people that wanted to move and go ahead with their daily activities. But those people were blocked, those people were beaten, and those cars that wanted to ferry people into town were being banned, were being stoned uh, by the so-called protesters. So you're basically saying there were people that were willing to participate in the protest, and those that were forced. In what way were people forced? I know you've mentioned a few pointers on how people were forced, but I would like us to dig uh, deep into that and explain further on how people were forced to stay away. Okay, when you look at um, the stairway, which was um, scheduled for Monday, uh, for, by 11 o'clock, nothing really sinister was happening. People were just going about uh, doing their duties as they do every day. But uh, as the organizers of the protest, we, I think this, this protest, it was not a mistake, uh, or it was not uh, something that just came up, but it was something that was planned from what I see. Because when you, you see people not wanting to participate in a stairway, and then those people being coerced not to do whatever. We, we have incidences of people who are approaching schools that were open and say, why are you opened? Go back to go back home, close the school. Teachers were being harassed and beaten. Uh, for instance, in Ishati, there was an incident where teachers were being harassed by the so-called protesters to go back home because they wanted their protest or their stay away to be successful. But uh, from the look of things, it was going to be a flop, a monumental flop, because Zimbabweans are tired of being used by politicians for political gain. Is it a constitutional right? To protest? Zimbabwe is currently moving uh, in the new constitution. We are being operating under a new constitution. And in that constitution, we have section 59, which expressly says everyone has the right to demonstrate, everyone has the right to petition government. And then it says, but, that but comes, it says, that protestation, that demonstration, and that petitioning should also and should also be peaceful. And what we saw from Monday to Wednesday was not peaceful. And we cannot say it was constitutional. It was undemocratic and it was unconstitutional. That was the unfortunate part of the protest that took place last week. And mm -hmm. you are stating that constitutionally, Zimbabweans have the right to protest and petition the government. But yes. it has to be peaceful. Yes. Why do you think the protest turned to be violent and people ended up looting uh, stores of innocent businessmen that are going about their business? Why do you think that happened? That happened because there is an agenda behind everything. It was not a mistake that people started looting. It was pre-planned, like I said prior. It was pre-planned because there is an idea, there is an agenda by the MDC Alliance to delegitimize the government and put Zimbabwe back on the world map for negative things. The idea was to cause chaos and to provoke state machinery so that they can come back and cry and say, look what the state is doing to us. The agenda was not an agenda to protest. The agenda was not an agenda to stay away from work because they were not going to benefit anything from staying away from work. The idea was to put back Zimbabwe on their map, which they wanted. And as you are aware, Emerson Munangaga, the president, was on his way to Davos, where he was going to look for investors to come and invest in Zimbabwe. And what better way than to protest, cause chaos, so that that 
that his agenda for Davos is already thrown uh, into tatters. But we understand that it's an agenda that is one meant to derail engagement efforts by Zimbabwe, secondly meant to delegitimize Zimbabwe, and the third agenda is to force Zimbabwe into a negotiating table through the the, the, the issuance of violence as we witnessed last week. So are you saying that CTU might be in bed with the opposition parties in Zimbabwe in order to put pressure on the existing government? Exactly. Exactly. It's indeed that, that way. We understand. If you look at, in as much as the MDC now would try to refuse and pretend as if they were not part of the organization and the execution of the protest, they are trying to paint a picture that these protests were sporadic and citizen-driven. They were not. ZCTU is known to having been in bed with the opposition. They are known to be an affiliate of the MDC alliance or the MDC, whatever they're calling themselves now. But we understand that the idea, as you know, they are pursuing a national dialogue. They are pursuing a, a journey of sorts in their, I don't know, in their, in their craft of things. But that, they understand that government is adamant. Government is saying the only place that we can do a national dialogue or the only place that is where we can have talks is the constitutionally given place like the parliament. Come let's dialogue within the context of parliament. And because they are refusing and they know that they are outnumbered in parliament, that's why they have to uh, start doing uh, violent things so that they can try and bring and force other nations to come into Zimbabwe and force Zimbabwe into a negotiating table. So there will rise in fuel prices because... Yeah. Generally on social media, even in mainstream media, they are calling the protest a fuel protest. So is this just a front? It's not actually a fuel protest, but it was uh, an opportunity for the opposition to, to, to put pressure on the government, as I mentioned. It, it wasn't a fuel protest. As we began 2019, many MDC officials like Charlton Wende, their MP, uh, we had people like... Uh, you know, David Coulthard with a lot of, of their leaders, including Lagos Panda, the, the presidential spokesperson of their party, they were saying 2019 is a revolutionary, they call it a revolutionary year, because they are saying 2019, what we want to do in 2019 is to force government into a negotiating table. 2019 is revolutionary. And revolution to them means violence. Revolution to them means looting. Revolutions to them means uh, uh, burning cars and burning hospitals, beating up polit polit police officers, beating up teachers for actually doing their duties. So. This was, this was planned, like we said, and it's clear that their agenda is just an agenda, like I said, to force Zimbabwe into a so-called negotiating table so that they can get spoils of power. You and I both, we agree that um, the protests tend to be violent, uh, it tend to be not peaceful, uh, but the unfortunate part is the majority of the participants are young people, young people like yourself and myself. Is there a future for young people in Zimbabwe? The future of young people is in the hands of the young people themselves. They are the ones who are supposed to define the kind of future they want. The future of Zimbabweans is in the hands of the young people, as it were. That question of the generation is, a inter, is an interesting question. But there is also an understanding that even as we saw uh, that a lot of young people were the ones that were involved in this, in this protest. Why? Because young people are prone to be used. Because many of our youths are unemployed. So they are prone to be used. Maybe they are being offered uh, dirty pieces of silver so that they can come in and join the political agenda of politicians. But like some were calling before they even the stay away, let young people not be used by the politicians because when the spoils are being shared, the young people will be forgotten. All this that is happening is happening because there are politicians who want to get a seat in the power uh, couch, as it were. But don't you think there are other young people out there who are saying, I'm actually building my future, fighting for my future by going to the streets and protesting and putting pressure on the government? Protesting and demonstrating against government is a constitutional right as expressed through Section 59 of the Constitution. It's a right. Everyone should do that. It will be a welcome development when young people come together and they protest and demonstrate, albeit peacefully. The idea is to maintain peace and not do it through demonstrations that are violent and that are detrimental. Right now, stores were looted and now people are failing to buy their daily goodies simply because people looted at the stores. That right to demonstrate is given. That right to fight for your future is given. But you don't fight for your future, you don't fight for your meal by burning the kitchen. Now, did the president run away from the protest? The president ran away from the protest? How does he run he away? He made the announcement of fuel hikes. The next day he was on a plane to go to Europe to look for investment and the country turned into turmoil. And uh, we see some comments even online on Twitter. Uh, 
to quote actually Lumumba said the president ran away from Zimbabwe. Oh, you can't quote Lumumba and make that factual. Lumumba is just a, a Twitter clown, and you cannot put him in, into context and make him a fact. Whatever he says is not biblical truth. What happened is that the president is a schedule as a president, and he is a schedule, he's a presidential schedule. He had to go to Davos, he had to go to Russia and all the countries that he visited. But he cannot stop doing his duties simply because there were people that will purport that he's running away from the situation. He announced that fuel likes, uh, the fuel is going to increase to $3.31, and soon after, he had a journey to travel to, to Russia. And on which in the same press conference he announced the fuel likes, he announced to the nation that he will be traveling to those countries to look for investors. So this idea and notion that the president ran away from the crisis is uh, frivolous and fallacious and should be discarded into, you know, whatever beans. Now let's transition into uh, what people are terming the aftermath of the stairway, of the protest. Yeah. Now, the response from the police, the heavy presence of the police after the protests, um, the eventual presence of the army in the streets and in our cities. Now, your opinion on that response, the heavy crackdown of the protesters? I don't want to use the word crackdown. I want to use the word constitutional. Uh, I can't call what the police and army are doing constitutional. I'm not the spokesperson of government, by the way. But what I can say is that what the army and the police are doing right now is primarily constitutional in line with their mandate given by the constitution. The police to maintain uh, the rule of law and to keep uh, law and order. The, the army to, to control the security situation in the country. What is happening was now a security issue. It was a security risk where schools are burnt, houses are being stoned, cars are being burnt, people are being beaten, police officers are being beaten to death. One died in Ndumbani, may, may his soul rest in peace. Simply because of this protest, it became a security issue. And obviously, uh, any other country, the security will have to take um, um, you know, preemptive measures to stop any furtherance of the same. Remember, they were promising that uh, on Monday, the last Monday, that we just passed. They were going to continue with their protest. So the army and police presence in the streets is primarily to preempt any more damage that, uh, that is being caused by the, uh, the opposition uh, in trying to force government into what they call a negotiating table. Now, is Zimbabwe a military state? No. What, what, what makes you say so? I mean, we've seen that the presence of the military in places that you wouldn't think the military should be involved. Uh, Zimbabwe is a constitutional democracy. Constitutional democracy that in the Zimbabwe respects its constitution. The 2018 constitution is express, expressive on these things. The presence of the army in the streets is primarily to beef up the police. And there is an act that guides that. You cannot just see the army coming in. You didn't see the army walking around on Christmas, did you? Does the act allow the army to beat up people? No act can allow people to be beaten. And Is the, the army beating up people? I cannot say that. I have never seen anyone who said he's been beaten by the police. What I have seen are pictures on social media. Some googled from Uganda and Rwanda and put on social media, purported to be the Zimbabwean army. Let's, let's talk about Bulawayo. Do you think uh, in Bulawayo people were beaten up by soldiers? I don't know. From what I have seen, I come from Keta, nothing like that happened. Now, on your way to work, for example, you live in Keta, yes. uh, and there's been makeshift roadblocks that have been mounted by soldiers. Have you seen soldiers on your way to work? Yes, I've seen some. Okay, and yes. that's also part of their constitutional right to mount roadblocks? That is part in of the their... absence of police officers? That is their constitutional right to maintain peace and security in the country. And the peace and security are at the utmost importance. You need to understand something. There is a security issue in Zimbabwe currently at play. We have shops that were looted in the, in the, in the suburbs, in the western suburbs, and everyone is moving into town to buy. But not, not everyone is coming to, to town to buy, especially with the reports that another shutdown was looming. There was a need that these roadblocks be set up. And those roadblocks are set up primarily to control that situation uh, where people are saying, let's go to the CBD and cause much chaos so that it can make international headlines. Now, in the, the, the response that the government has given uh, through the police officers and the soldiers, were there human rights violations? I will not speak on behalf of government. No, I'm not saying speak on behalf of government. In your own opinion, 
were there human rights violations? Human rights violations, maybe there are excesses here and there. I may not be able to ascertain where exactly. But obviously, in any situation, you have excesses of, of, of violations here and there. But I may not be in a point to comment whether they were being done by the army police or the opposition at this level. But what I know and what I'm inclined to believe is that all this that was happening was being pursued and pushed by the opposition in their agenda. Now, in light of all this that's taking place, is Emerson, President Emerson Ambuds of Nangagwa, in control of the country? He's in full control. He's the President of the Republic. What makes you say that? Because he was voted for by people last year, for a five-year term, and that term ends in 2023. Is he going to deliver on his promises? Definitely. Because the biggest frustration out there is people are saying he's not delivering on what he said he would deliver on. Obviously, yes, and rightly so. People should be um, questioning those. And that is the genius of a democracy. People should question the president. And by the way, when he came, came into power, he said he's going to be a listening president. But uh, the issue is not to abuse that facility of him being a listening president to be a facility of him being an insulted president. What we need is constructive criticism that he helps develop the Zimbabwe we want. Now, looking at the opposition uh, president, uh, the prominent one, uh, Nelson Chamisa, he outrightly spoke against uh, the, the response of the government on unarmed civilians, on the protesters, on the looters. Uh, but what I did not see was his uh, response to the actual looting and the violence during the protests. But he only spoke out about the government's uh, response to the people. What do you have to say about that? How can you condemn your actions? How can you condemn what you have planned? Obviously, he was going to zoom out and magnify the extent of what he wanted to magnify because ideally they wanted to put Zimbabwe back on the international map with negative news. So they could not talk about looters, they could not talk about police cars being bent because it was going to paint a picture of them being violent. So he's being clever and cunning, like always. Okay. Yeah. Now He's the people's president. Which people? Which are people? The people chose their president in July 2018. They did so by voting for Emerson Mnangagwa, who was contesting under the ZANU PF ticket. He won the elections and is going to be president until 2023. He is the people's president. Facebook presidents, Twitter presidents, and WhatsApp presidents can never be called people's presidents. Now, there's a 2030 vision that the government has laid out. Should the government be given time to fulfill those promises before the next stay away, before the next protest? Uh... Well, uh, the government's plan, the Vision 2030, is premised on creating an upper middle income economy by 2030. And that, uh, and, and that is uh, given under the, 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 the tagline, austerity for prosperity, for, for prosperity. And what we have seen so far, we have seen a lot of action towards that. We have seen a lot of uh, expenditure cuts. We have seen the government even uh, firing the 2,300 uh, youth officers that were employed by the Ministry of Youth in an uh, expression of, uh, of, of cutting the spending that government is pursuing. And another strategy that government has pursued is to increase our tax back bracket. That's why we saw the, in, uh, the, the introduction of the 2% tax. This is the idea, you cut, you cut your spending, but you increase your, your income, and then you, you begin to develop. A lot of our money as a country was going through, uh, was going to, you know, recurrent expenditure, paying civil servants. But what government is saying now, through austerity for posterity, the TSP, Transitional Stabilizing Program, it's saying, no, let's push that money that we're pursuing and pushing towards civil servants, and let's push it towards productive sectors of the economy. And once that, that is done, we'll begin to see the fruits of the TSP as propounded by the Minister of Finance. In conclusion, Menashe, what do you have to say to the people of Zimbabwe, particularly the young people of this country like yourself? The young people of this country, the future is in their hands. They, they should not be you know, sold by dirty coins of silver, uh, by politicians who are pursuing their own personal agendas. The young people should be passive uh, should not be passive recipients of uh, policies that government is pursuing, but they should be active participants. Young people should be part of the program that the government is pursuing. And go no government can do anything without the young people. And the young people are here. It's here 
and now that we need to rise up and begin to help government put shoulder on the wheel and begin to pursue policies that will improve our livelihoods so that we can also have the future we want. That future, the middle income economy we are talking about by 2030 is talking about the young people, the current young people. No other young person will come but us, the young people in the current generation. So it's up to us to be part of the generation that shall be written for having transformed their country or the generation that bent down the country when a president was eager to transform the country into a better future. Minasha, thank you for joining us on Politrix. Until next time. You're welcome. Thank you.